Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. Cake Wallet is trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. We grabbed some interviews from a few of the big name speakers at the North American Bitcoin Conference in Miami, including Nick Spano, an early Bitcoin entrepreneur who pioneered the New York City Bitcoin Center on Wall Street, Liad Chatret, a crypto policy and regulation advisor with the blockchain analytics company Elliptic, and Mark Cuban, a celebrity investor who needs no introduction. The conference was packed with thousands of attendees and grabbing Mark Cuban in particular, unfortunately was not under ideal circumstances, so we apologize for not being able to have a deeper conversation with him. But we hope you enjoy some of the revealing tidbits from each speaker. Our takeaway from the conference as a whole is, old school crypto people respect Monero and believe it provides value as digital cash, while the vast majority of attendees don't even really understand what a true cryptocurrency really is. They are ironically blinded by the allure of non-fungible tokens. We have a lot of work to do to educate crypto news about the importance of digital cash. The good news is we believe they will eventually find their way to Monero. Monero Talk starts now. All right. Nick, what's going on, man? Not much. We're over here in uh, Miami, sunny, sunny Miami, uh, enjoying the festivities, enjoying the uh, place that isn't locked down, and uh, trying to enjoy a little freedom before they put us in a cage. A lot different than New York, right? You're the guy that started the New York Bitcoin Center, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was 2013. Uh, it was the first physical uh, cryptocurrency exchange, and I built it 100 feet from the New York Stock Exchange on the ground floor. Ricardo showed up, you know, before Monero, and he told me about Monero, and I was like, oh, that sounds good, but I don't think we can do it in New York. <laughs> well, that's what I want to ask you. What do you think about that? I mean, uh, you know, New York obviously isn't what it used to be in terms of uh, being the, the kind of the, the liberal ca liberty capital of the world, um, and we're seeing that with cryptocurrency. Like, it's, it's, uh, it's not the place you want to be if you're into crypto right now. Yeah, I mean, after we built the exchange, you know, they created the bit license. I mean, it's memorialized in the movie, the Netflix documentary, Banking on Bitcoin. And uh, explains how the regulators got a little overzealous and uh, the one guy wanted to uh, sell his services as the only person who knew the bit license. And that was pretty much the prime motivator in creating the bit license and kicking out everyone. Uh, you know, everyone, everyone left New York because they were just afraid of the regulation. So I think, what do I think about it? You think it's going to change? I think we should not care. And uh, we have to move boldly uh, as innovators and uh, early adopters and uh, change the world like we've been doing and, then don't, and not listen to any of them because it's all static. They're buying it themselves and they're lying to us. So I think we really have to uh, focus on the decentralized future and uh, bring it about as, as fast as possible. And, uh, you know, no sleep till the, till we're decentralized because uh, we have this small window of opportunity at this moment to be able to capture uh, freedoms that haven't been uh, 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 expressed or allowed to exist for 10,000 years. And we have this little window of opportunity. If we don't take it, this window, if we don't go through the window, if we don't break down the doors, if we don't act boldly, you know, they're going to put us in a box. And uh, I mean, you know, I said that right before COVID. I go, oh, you want a big mansion? You know, they're going to lock you. They're not going to let you leave the mansion. And it happened like a few months later. I say, oh, you want a car? They're not going to let you drive. Oh, you want a Lambo? They're not going to let you drive. That's not what this is about. 
I mean, uh, we have to really understand that this is the moment in time, and it was, it's up to us, it's not up to anyone else, that this is the moment in time that we're gonna be able to free ourselves, finally, or be imprisoned by the permissioned uh, databases, you know, database silos. We, if, if we don't free ourselves with the permissionless uh, blockchain uh, applications and uh, cryptocurrency, and we're, and, we're, and we're really doing it through the pri through the power of encryption, this ability to use encryption to our benefit. Something that uh, even n no corporation or government can even break. So it kind of levels the playing field. I, I have access to encryption, just like the United States government has access to encryption. And now it's allowing us to transact in a way that's essentially unstoppable without permission. Oh, 100%. And uh, if people don't want the fiat that the governments are making, then the people will t take back the power that's been taken from them over the past uh, millennia, you know? So this is the moment. Monero's one of the. Yeah, one but what's, of the your players. what's your take on Monero, man? So I was just asking Mark, Mark Cuban, and. Uh, I wasn't very impressed by his answer. First I said, what do you think about privacy? He said, I don't really, I, he's like, uh, I think it's nice that people like you care about it. He's like, but I don't really see a use for it. Uh, he, he just doesn't really even think crypto needs to be private. What's your take on that? Well, you know, he's part of the system and uh, he's been part of the system for a long time. And that's the world he knows. So to a hammer, everything's a nail. But uh, like I said, we, you know, there's a lot of new people coming in for their reasons, and that's fine. And I've said for many uh, for many years that everyone else's greed is gonna bring us over the top and we're gonna be able to decentralize. So it doesn't matter what he individually thinks, it matters what the people think. So I think the people will adopt uh, uh, more so Monero and uh, other secrecy coins or I don't know, you're sure, you don't have to call them secrecy coins. I hate calling them privacy. It's just a true crypto. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the encryption is used for provability. And uh, why do you have to, if someone sees your wallet, why do they have to see every one of your transactions in the past? It's silly. If I use my credit card, they don't get to see all my transactions that I did in my life. If I use my credit cards, it's the same thing. Right. So we're like a credit card. <laughs> Tell Cuban. It's like a credit card. You don't get to see everyone's transactions. Right, right, right. It's that simple. Yeah. I mean, uh, pushing it the other way scares uh, the old guard because they know that their, their days are numbered. And uh, if we if we move forward the way we can, the way we have to, with boldness and uh, perseverance, then we'll be able to. We'll be able to. You know. How about people that are are. are how about people that are afraid to get into Monero because they're like, uh, it's going to get regulated, you know, they're, they're worried that governments are going to come after it. You know, that's a fear, and uh, they're going to scare the centralized exchanges. But uh, Monero just has to work on its DeFi side, and uh, that's it. And everyone's going to use it. It doesn't matter if they're sitting in the privacy of their home and uh, no one's watching. They're going to use Monero. Even Mark Cuban is going to use it. But he knows what he has to say publicly. All right, Matt. Thank you so much. Any advice to the Monero community on what <laughs> they could be doing better to, to help grow the ecosystem? You have to move boldly and speak boldly and maybe just say it's like a credit card. No one gets to see your old transactions. I mean... Uh, that's the way it should be explained, I think, at this junction right now. And uh, where's Ricardo? I don't know. That's, that's a good question. I don't know where he is. Yo, he Fluffy Pony, where are you? <laughs> it's been a few years, a couple years. You think we'll ever see a, a Monero Center in New York? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker. I'm from New York, so... Uh, I would love to love to see things change and for them to start to really be more open to crypto, particularly Monero. You can't even buy Monero on an exchange in New York. Listen, Monero, I mean, New York is, uh, you know, it's too far gone right now. Even with the mayor, he can't change the laws. 
That's uh, the DFS came up with a, the bit license and uh, screwed a lot of us. And then when I sent out, I said, listen, we got to move you. We got to move you here. You got to go to Estonia. You got to go here. You got to go there. And we moved all every all the startups. Uh, they all flourished. Anyone who stayed in New York pretty much got screwed. What do you think of all these chain analytics companies? Uh, you know, is I mean, they did it for like the penny stocks and they just want a foothold in and uh, they're going to bring in new people and try to get them to buy their shit coin probably. No, no, these chain analytics companies oh, that are oh, analyzing, analysis. yeah, that are analyzing the, the Bitcoin chain blockchain. Analysis. Yeah, I wanted to get rid of those guys a, a lot earlier in the game when they showed up. But, uh, you know. They're here to stay and they have a, 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 a lot of influence in the in the industry. Yeah. Some people say that's why we're not seeing Monero on as many exchanges because they're the ones that are basically telling exchanges not to add Monero because they don't really have a service to offer the exchanges for tracking and tracing Monero. Well, listen, Monero shouldn't even be on a, a centralized exchange anyway. I mean, that's the reality. Agree, agree. Because the centralized exchanges are going to disappear soon anyway. So... It'll be like uh, the AOL of, of the internet. Yeah, why hang on to the dinosaur? You know, you gotta, you gotta go with the monkeys. <laughs> All right, Nick. Thanks so much. Thanks for taking the time. I hope you enjoyed the espresso. Thank you. I did. I did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye you. Now. All right, Leah. Thanks for uh, coming on. This is actually Monero talk. I don't know. Have you ever seen Monero talk? Uh, one or two. Really? All right. Okay. So, obviously, in the Monero community. Um, we're concerned about the potential for, for regulation. Could you give us any insight into what regulation may look like for privacy, I hate calling them privacy coins, for a coin like Monero in, in the upcoming future? Yeah, I think we hate calling them privacy coins too, but inevitably it's what they're called because it's what's ingrained um, in the technology and I think that's the concern that we're hearing from regulators primarily. Um, I think it's about helping regulators understand why would they need a privacy coin unless it's for illicit purposes. So the more messaging Monero can put out and other like-minded coins as to why it is that um, privacy is needed around these kinds of coins because it doesn't necessarily involve illicit trafficking or narcotics or other you know, dark market um, purchases, the, the, the better reputation coins like Monero would have. And so we're seeing exchanges delist Monero, um, but our understanding, or a lot of those in the Monero community, is that Monero itself is really no different than cash, and that there is no currently no regulation or rule saying that you know exchanges can't list or sell Monero. But why are we seeing these 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 delistings if they are in fact allowed to currently trade Monero? When it comes to cash and fiat, you've had years and years and years of anti-money laundering frameworks, um, terrorism, counter-terrorism finance frameworks that have, that have cooked up what is an acceptable regulatory regime that nobody really thinks is perfect, but at least it's what we know. It's effective to a degree. And I think anytime you introduce something new, particularly around a virtual asset like Monero and its characteristics, the way it's being um, touted reputationally is something that's quite you know undermining your mission in a way. Um, so, so I think... We need to be able to make parallels around how can we benefit from coins like Monero in the same ways that we've benefited from just having a cash economy. What, have that, what has that done and helped us do? Um, uh, and I think from a regulatory perspective, there's always an interest in how do we mitigate risks that are associated with privacy? Um, you know, how do we make sure that we understand know your, customer, know your customer obligations, customer due diligence obligations, and until we find out how to do that with privacy coins, I think we're going to be stuck in the same equation. Um, but coming back to cash is always a good, you know, unpacking discussion to have with regulators. So do you think we get to the point where crypto, true cryptos like Monero are treated in the same way cash is treated, or is it going to be held to a different standard? I think it's a long haul. I think it's a, it's a future, future Monero question and, and issue. Um, I, I, I don't see it happening in the immediate time, given where I see the crypto regulatory discussions taking place. I'll put this idea that Monero itself is unstoppable. It's here to stay, uh, kind of like the internet itself. Um, what happens then once, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer economy really starts to take off? 
people are using Monero on their own and they don't even really need exchanges anymore. Maybe they're exchanging through decentralized net networks or atomic swaps. Uh, how do governments and regulators then react to that? I think, I think this comes back to this current point of this is the moment to lobby, this is the moment to educate. We don't want to come to the point where there's a, where there's a showdown between you know, crypto enthusiasts and supporters and the government, right? We don't want to reach that. Um, there's no real way to shut it down. I think it's more about how do we work together and collaborate? How do we create private-public partnerships right now that help us push the message that crypto is here to stay, that crypto is here to, to help with, you know, properly giving meat to sound bites like financial inclusion and so on. So we really need to be focusing on um, that kind of messaging. And, and, and I, I really think we have a lot of space to manipulate in right now or maneuver in because regulators are open. And I think we should um, help educate them on, on this entire journey. People that are hesitant to get involved with Monero that say, oh no, it's, it's going to be regulated. Uh, what, what do you what do you say to those people? Should there be a hesitancy there from the the general consumer here, especially here in the U.S., or is it something that you know they necessarily shouldn't be concerned about? My perspective at this particular moment in time is that there should be a concern, um, uh, given where you know the winds are blowing. Ask me tomorrow, I'll have a different answer for you. So uh, I, I think that changes. Uh, but definitely uh, uh, stay engaged in the space. But I do think at the moment it's, it's of concern because we're seeing it um, being associated with, with um, illicit purposes and that's what's being touted in the press. I would say, you know, push out alternate narratives. Demonstrate how it's not just used for illicit purposes. Um, there's a, one of the rumors going around in, in the Monero community is that companies like Elliptic are influencing exchanges and they're the ones that are essentially at the end of the day suggesting that maybe they should be delisting is there any any truth to these rumors no so so companies like like elliptic um uh, which as you know i i'm here representing are, are really to enable risk mitigation of exchanges an, a, an exchange is responsible for producing their own risk assessment identifying and, and segmenting their own customer base the elliptic tools and blockchain analytics are really meant to help them along that journey to help them understand where they have weaknesses where they have gaps where they have exposures and give them utility and visibility um, th there is no way that elliptic is enabling rumors in general we're, we're, we're definitely promoting um, you know open secure um, crypto space and, and helping promote the, the and safeguarding the financial integrity of the space and that's that's the mission of the company but in a scenario where you know maybe an exchange approaches a company like like yours for for that purposes of using tools for reducing uh, their risk or for better following regulation and then they're told uh, well with Monero there, there currently is no tool um, are they then delisting because of that, because no such tools exist for that purpose? I can't speak to the reason that exchanges would choose to delist. I think if anything, Elliptic speaks to regulators from a perspective of enabling the community and say delisting wholesale is, is, is not a great idea, it's a bad idea. Just like de-risking is a terrible idea. We need to be learning how to manage those risks. And I think Elliptic is a partner to regulators and industry and in walking that fine line to enable that. I don't think there's a solution out there at the moment that enables um, that fully, but I think we're all growing in a super explosive space. And um, I think Elliptic is a partner to both sides to make sure that we try, you know, if there is something to be done, that we can do it and we can do it effectively. So, so I would say stay tuned, you know, we're developing. Does Elliptic offer tools for Monero? for analyzing Monero in any way? As far as I know, there's no blockchain analytics company at the moment um, that offers that. Do you think we've kind of reached the peak in terms of delisting? So we, ha we have exchanges like Kraken, that's that major exchange that's offering Monero. Uh, thankfully, we haven't seen them delist here in the US. Do you think potentially the worst is over in that regard and that things may start to swing back? I, I can't assess what individual exchanges will do. Definitely not in that position. Happy for, for you to chat to you know the multiple exchanges that are represented here. Um, but, but I think that there's always space to mitigate risk. And I think that's what exchanges are tasked with and that's what they're going to be doing and continue to do and be obligated to do from a compliance and regulatory perspective. So to the degree that you know, we can help do that and help educate around that. I think we should be doing um, and firing on all cylinders. What type of, uh, you know, what, what is, I guess, kind of the, the 
ethos of Elliptic? What is what is their worldview? What do they want crypto to look like and be like in the future? You have you have the cypherpunks, uh, which really aligns with the ethos of Monero, where they want to be able to transact freely, essentially with no censorship, uh, with nobody being able to sur surveil. What is Elliptic's standpoint with that regard? Do they do they share that ethos in any way, or is it they want um, a perfectly transparent transactional system? I think I think Elliptic's perspective is that we are enabling and safeguarding um, an industry to go about their business, and you know we are here to provide the tools that help each company, depending on their own risk appetite and their own risk tolerance, to pursue their business objectives. That's not up to Elliptic to decide. That's something that we are enabling in terms of just making sure that we're helping connect the dots, tracking illicit funds, um, and, and making sure that companies are able uh, to capably and effectively um, deliver on risk mitigation. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for your genuine answers. Good to see you. Thank you so much. How's it going, man? Good, man. How are you doing? Good. Good. So we heard you talking a lot about non-fungible tokens. What's your take on fungible tokens? I don't have a take on fungible tokens. Okay. Are you familiar with... What's your take on, on privacy and cryptocurrency? you have any opinion there? You, yeah. I Whether mean, it's, it's required. It's not required. That's not a big deal to me. I, you just don't have any privacy for the most part. And I think, you know, there's certain people who really, really value it and more power to them. But to me, it's not that, that big a deal. And so I put this idea that every every coin should equal every other coin for the purposes of implementing digital cash. I don't know how you'd even coordinate that. So are you familiar with Monero? Do you know the yeah, Monero course, crypto? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the privacy one. And that's where yeah. everybody can get, do whatever. But... You know, I haven't spent any time with it. Okay. You just you don't you don't see a use case there. Or? I mean, it's been around forever, right? And so if that use case was going to pop up, it would have already popped up. So it's hard. You know, once once a token um, or platform has been around for a few years and kind of had its day in the sun, it's hard to recapture that. And and so. Well, it's grown in adoption on the dark markets and used for ransomware, right. things like that. Ransomware. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously not a positive, but you know, it is what it is. But do you think that shows a use case for this ability to transact without censorship? I mean, by definition, yes. But will it end up being um, regulated in some way? Yeah, of course. Right? So it's hard to sustain that um, when you do everything in the dark. Do you think there's a kind of a, a purpose there with crypto to build something that essentially can't be regulated, can't be stopped by governments? I mean, a lot of people want to do that, obviously. Um, but to me, that's not the primary use cases because I think there's really value in the applications that can be built on blockchain. And so, you know, just like cash has its dark side and, you know, bear bonds have their bar dark side, there's crypto that has its dark side, but that's not a primary use to, in my mind. Awesome. I greatly appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.